All right, this is the video we've all been waiting for. It is the King Crimson worst to best. I don't think King Crimson really needs an introduction at this point, outside of the fact that arguably they're the forefathers of progressive rock coming on the scene in the very late 60s and uh, just taking the world by storm. Coming in with so many different musicians, influencing each album, putting a whole different personality on each work that they do. So just a few ground rules before I start. Uh, obviously, everything that I say is fact. There's no argument in there. It's 100% objectively true. Um, you know, the complete ranking is, of course, how we should all view the albums going forward in terms of number one being the absolute best and the last one is garbage. We shouldn't listen to it anymore. Um, <laughs> some people actually believe that. Uh, no, this is all my personal opinion. This is just my own take on each of the albums. I'm not saying that number one is the definitive best album that the band has put out. I'm not saying that the one that I label as number 13 is the definitive worst album. I'm just saying that if all the albums were laid out in front of me, which one would I go for last, which is the one I'll be talking about first, and which one would I listen to first, which is the one I'm going to be talking about last. I'm not going to give a full detailed review of each album. I'm just going to give a little bit of context, a little bit of my own personal feelings, uh, maybe a little bit of, you know, what I think about the album, but it's not going to be an in-depth review. Uh, I'm going to list some highlights, um, at least for the first half of them, some weaknesses, uh, but for the most part, this is just supposed to be a little bit of fun. Um, you know, I'm going to be gushing quite a bit, so... You know, if you're in the first three rows, get ready for some splashing. Because, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's going to be a gush zone. Also, with King Crimson, they are a band to be listened to live. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about any of their live albums. They've put out a lot of fantastic live albums. And in some respects, that's the way you need to listen to them. I'm only going to be looking at studio releases. There's 13 of them, and I'm not going to be looking at a lot of the construction albums that they put out in like the 80s and 90s. So with those two in mind, let's dive into the worst to best King Crimson studio albums, all 13 of them. Let's just dive in. Number 13. Beat, released in 1982. So we come to the middle point of the three of a perfect pair suite of albums. This is in the 80s when they're trying some really technical jazz math rock. I'm not a big fan of this style and that's why these three albums that I'm going to be talking about first encompass that style. Uh, now this one really throws back to like the beat culture of like the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And a lot of that can be found on this album. This album is a very cool album. It's a sophisticated album, but that is not for me. I don't like this kind of style. What did Hamlet say? Less less art, more matter kind of an idea in this one. Like th there's, there's a lot to be said about this album. And I will put this on because there will be times in my life and like moments where I'm just like, I really need that beat. Um, but I really need to be in the specific mood for that. And that mood, comes very, very rarely for me. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it about Beat. A very fun, very cool album, but it's, it's just not for me. So let's move on to the next one. Number 12. Three of a Perfect Pair, released in 1984. So this is the last of those Three of a Perfect Pair trilogy of an album. Um, I like this one a little bit more than Beat. Um, like the two kind of go back and forth as to which one I like better. Uh, there are a few moments that I really like on Three of a Perfect Pair. And mainly the thing that I love about this one is the structure of the album. How we have the left and the right uh, versions of this album. And it's interesting too, uh, because, uh, the left side being the opening one, uh, is a little bit more light. It's jazzy. It's much more free flowing. It's much more of an artistic thought. And then the right side is much more structured. It's a little bit more math infused. It's got a little bit more of the analytical side of it. And if we're applying this to like the brain, you know, it's the right side. That's more of the artistic side and the left side. That's a little bit more of the analytical side. So we've got that duality about it as well. And I also, I know this has nothing to do with the music, but I really like the album cover. To me, it always looked like a chromosome. Uh, but, you know, doing research, it's all about, you know, the male phallus trying to penetrate the female divinity. And I'm like, well, I think we might be reaching. I mean, you can definitely draw a comparison to that. Uh, it's a very minimalistic thing. And these three albums, you know, starting with Discipline, Beat, and Three of a Perfect Pair, very minimalistic in terms of the album structure, very monochromatic in terms of like the layout. <laughs> I mean, when the strength of this album is kind of the overall concept and presentation of the album, yeah, I, I might be stretching a little bit, but that's kind of what puts it above beat. Like, I really like the structure. I love the free-flowing, jazzy, expressional... 
uh, kind of artistic side. And then I like more of the analytical, uh, mathy, very structured side. Uh, and Tony Levin on the bass, it shines through. And that's one thing that really elevates this album. Um, and I mean, the standout track on this one is definitely New Ages or something like that. Really, really funky and really fun. And like funky is definitely the, the word of the album for this one. All right, let's move on to the next one. Number 11. Discipline, released in 1981. Okay, 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 okay. I know a lot of people love this album and for very good reasons. This was the album that came out after the first hiatus of King Crimson and they came back with something completely different. And this is the thing that elevates it very much so beyond beat and Three of a Perfect Pair. I love how jazzy, how analytical, how technical, how strange, how avant-garde it all is. It's definitely leagues away from Red, the album that came out in 1974 before this album. And so just that huge transition is what really elevates this for me. I'm still not a big fan of the music that's found on this. Like the only two tracks that I really come back to are Indiscipline and Elephant Talk. And even Elephant Talk, I only really like because how strange and weird it is. It's not necessarily one that I'll sit down and really gain musical pleasure out of. It's more that I'll sit down and be like, ooh, that's funky. Ooh, that's strange. And you know, the the knots and the interplay and the interconnections between all the musicians. But I'm just not a really big fan. And Adrian Below, who I really admire moving forward uh, and his performances on a number of the albums, sometimes I'm just not a big fan of his off key singing style that was very adapted of a time. Like, I'm not a big fan of this new wave style. Yeah, let's move on to the next one. Number 10. Starless and Bible Black, released in 1974. Okay, so we're coming into kind of, in some respects, their heyday, the big outpour of creativity. And Starless and Bible Black, I, I always say gets overlooked because it's sandwiched between two huge Goliaths of an album. But at the end of the day, I still love Starless and Bible Black. I love the second side. I love how jazzy, impressionistic, and free-flowing those are. I mean, a lot of those snippets were taken from live recordings. I love Fractured. Fractured's probably one of my favorite tracks of the band. I love how proto to Danny Elfman this track feels. And I also love how explosive and raw the music is on this. And that can be seen just because of how much of this was taken from live recordings. But this album does have a lot of weaknesses. There's a lot of really strange jam sessions and when you're coming in with so much experimentation, not everything is gonna work out. Some of the songs do feel like they're, I don't know, odds and ends of other tracks that came before it. Uh, like We'll Let You Know feels like it's a little bit of a leftover from Fractured. And the same with the title track of Starless and Di Bible Black. I just feel like there's very little to build upon and kind of take the music forward. I also feel like we've been here before, um, especially with some of the things that had started with uh, Lark's Tongue and Aspect, the album that came before this. Uh, and I just feel like they didn't move the music forward as much as the albums previously had always done. They'd always move the music ridiculously far forward and like the mark was so far ahead. Yeah, let's, let's move on to the next one. Number nine. In the Wake of Poseidon, released in 1970. So this came off the heels very quickly of In the Court of the Crimson King, and it feels like they improved on things that they were doing really, really well, um, like Pictures of a City uh, being essentially a mirror of 21st century schizoid man, and In the Wake of Poseidon being a improvement on uh, In the Court of the Crimson King. But there are a few moments on here that just don't quite stick. I mean, the Devil's Triangle as a whole just... I don't even know what they were doing, and I don't know if they knew what they were doing. And even though the two tracks I already mentioned, Pictures of the City and In the Wake of Poseidon, they do still feel very much like clones of songs that came previously. Now, what I do like is kind of the structure of the album as well. I like how they've got these little interludes throughout the album, opening and closing and coming in and blossoming the album throughout. So in the wake of Poseidon, even though I love some of the tracks off of this, there's a lot to kind of shift through in order to get to those nuggets of gold. So yeah, that's why it's at number nine. Uh, so let's talk about number eight. Number eight. 
Lark's Tongue and Aspect, released in 1973. Okay, 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 okay. I'm going to get a lot of flack for this one. <laughs> Putting this at number eight, how do I rectify this? Um, well, it's just um, so... Even though there's a lot going for this album, there is a lot going for this album. It's the first album with Bill Bruford, and Bill Bruford's my favorite drummer of all time. He adds this explosion and punch to so many of these different tracks. Like the opening track of Lark's Tongue and Aspect Part 1 explodes with such a force that hadn't been heard before. And the ending track of Lark's Tongue and Aspect Part 2, again, it's, it's essentially pseudo-metal at that point. Like nothing had been that heavy and that raw and that emotive up until that point. Hands down, this is one of the hardest hitting albums of the entire career of King Crimson. I know a lot of you are wondering why I put it so high on the list. Um, really, it's because it's almost too experimental and there's a lot more, again, it's that less art, more matter kind of an idea. There's not a whole lot to really hold on to outside of the Larkstone and Aspect suites. Uh, I do love Exile. Uh, I feel like Exile is, or Exiles, um, again, it's very much like Lament. Uh, it's very heartfelt, it's very emotive. And I also really love the jazzy approach that the talking drum has, and I love the suite, how the talking drum goes straight into Lark's Tongue and Aspect Part 2. Yeah, there's still a lot of drawbacks to this album that I just can't get my head around. Like, it's it's a little bit unfocused. It's not quite as unfocused as uh, Starless and Bible Black, but... There's no moment on this album that I enjoy as much as Fractured or Lament. And that really lowered it. Uh, Easy Money is kind of a weak point of the album. And I know a lot of people love this track and I can understand why. But I just don't feel it. I don't really connect with that track all that much. This album would be a lot higher on any other list. But because King Crimson has put out so much amazing music up until this point... There's a lot still to talk about. So that's why Lark's Sun and Aspect is as high on the list as it is. Yeah, let's move on to the next album. Number seven. The Construction of Light, released in 2000. So yeah, I, I really, really love this album. Funky is the word that I would use for this particular piece. I love how strange, I love how fun, and I just love how unified this album is. There's a lot of throwback on this album. I mean, two songs off of this are direct reworkings. Uh, well, not direct reworkings. I mean, we've got Fractured, uh, which is kind of a reworking and an interpretation of the Starless and Bible Black track, uh, as well as uh, Lark's Tongue and Aspect Part 4, which is probably my favorite of the Lark's Tongue and Aspect movements. I love the ending part of this track. It just, I gush when we get to that ending part. Like that's one of those like close your eyes and just head bang away to it moments. And that is what really elevates this album for me. But I also really, really enjoy the title track of The Construction of Light and how really fun this is. It feels like it's a vinyl throwback and the band is so much more focused. Like it feels like they took all those unfocused, wandering the wilderness moments that were found on uh, Starless and Bible Black and on Lark's Tongue and Aspect and tighten those back up. It's a very heavy and heavy hitting and punchy album that has that sophistication and jazzy approach. And I love how large the sound is. It's not quite as large because now we're working with the, um, you know, just the the four of them, I think it is. I think it's the, the duel uh, because Tony Levin and Bill Bruford had left for this album uh, as opposed to Thrak, which still had the two on there. There still has an explosive sound and that's what really elevates it for me. So yeah, all right, let's move on to the next one. Number six. Thrak, released in 1995. The only album to be released in the 90s. I really, really enjoy this album. Um, I think somebody had written that this was a monster, and that is a perfect, like, title for this album uh, overall. Like, each of these albums, as I mentioned, has, like, a key term, and Monster is definitely the album of this. I love how big the sound is. Like, this is the duo trio of, you know, two uh, drummers, two bass players, two guitarists, all of them working in tandem. And I love how on the Vroom um, tracks where you have them all unified on one track and then splitting apart within the stereo tracks, very, very well done. And again, you've got that explosiveness um, and 
this is the thing that I love that I think the 80s albums were definitely missing is the leap forward in terms of the progression of music. You can definitely feel that between 84 and 95, that progression was still going on. And this is like the end point of that progression. And so it feels like there's no wasted space off of this album. Everything is kind of put down exactly where you want to. And I love the rhythm. I love the flow of this album. The rhythm of this album is just so meaty. And again, Bill Bruford and Tony Levin just shine so hard on this. Uh, I love Dinosaur. I love the track Dinosaur. It hits so hard and I love how funky it is. Um, I really like also the uh, variations of tracks off of this. Uh, One Time and Walking on Air are throwback to more of those mellower aspects. And I think King Crimson doesn't get enough call out of their more mellow tracks, things that we found on Islands or in the Chord of the Crimson King, where it's very somber, it's very emotive. And it's interesting because I can't really put my finger on any real weaknesses, but everything does kind of blend together. And outside of, say, Dinosaur, there's no one track that really stands out for me. And that also includes the Vroom Suites, right? You got Vroom and Vroom Vroom and the Vroom Vroom Coda and all those other ones. This album is a journey and there's no one particular moment that really stands out outside of Dinosaur. And I think maybe that kind of put it where it is on its list. Um, So yeah. All right, let's move on to the next one. Number five. Lizard, released in 1970. Okay, so if In the Wake of Poseidon was too similar to In the Court of the Crimson King, then this one is as far away as you can get. And their third album really shows how progressive the band can be. This is almost very much like a renaissance style. Like a lot of this are like medieval, very knights and dragons. I mean, the title track of Lizard, the 20 minute suite is essentially a battle between Prince Rupert and the dragon. Um, And I also love how each of these songs are a little story. Like this is one of those albums where I can listen to the entire thing and not feel like there's a moment that's wasted on it. And Lizard, the title track, that big 20 minute sweep, has one of the most beautiful moments ever recorded in musical history. And it's with the clarinet and that jazzy sequence. That just makes me melt every time I listen to it. It's so well realized that I just like French kisses everywhere. Just mwah, mwah, mwah. Uh, But even this, it's still a lot of fun. They have some of those moments like happy family and indoor games that are very fun, very jovial but still have that punch. Uh, Circus, the opening track of this, when we get into that synthesizer that's playing, the first time that I heard this, it felt like my face was melting. It was just like that... Like, it just hit me so hard. I'm like, what is this? Uh, It's very meaty, very impactful, but it doesn't just stay in that camp. It then, then blends through and goes on to a little bit of a different game. So yeah, Lizard is a fantastic treat and one that I always go back to. Uh, It's one of the more quirky albums and that's, you know, if Renaissance or quirky were the title, like little gnomer of this, that's where I'd put it. So yeah, uh, that's about it for Lizard. Very, very fun. Uh, Let's go on to the next one. Number four, The Power to Believe, released in 2003. The final album from King Crimson, at least on this list in terms of um, chronological, uh, released in 2003. This was the one that I had probably the most amount of time with. I got this back in high school and I just fell in love. So many amazing tracks off this. Level 5, which is essentially the final piece of the Lark's Tongue and Aspect, which is why it's called Level 5. It's the fifth part of that suite. Uh, Dangerous Curves being this building, building, like, I love the build of Dangerous Curves. It becomes this monster. Um, And I also really, really love Be Happy With What You Have To Be Happy With. It's just so fun. It's so catchy. It's so, like, you almost want to dance around with it. And I also really love Open Your Eyes. Um, I love how somber this track can be at times, how fun and jazzy it is. I can't believe sometimes what I'm listening to with this album. It's so good and deceivingly good as well. It feels like they've took everything that they've learned within Thrak and within uh, the construction series uh, and the projects series and really unified and put it on this album. Uh, I can see that Robert Fripp would be more proud of this than the construction of Light. All right, so let's go on to number three. Number three. 
Red, released in 1974. This is an interesting album because this is probably one of the most accessible albums that the band has ever really put out. Like it's got some singles on there like Fallen Angel and One More Red Nightmare. The final track of Starless is a staple now. Uh, it's probably my favorite King Crimson track. Especially coming off of the heels of Lark's Tongue and Aspect and uh, Starless and Bible Black. It's interesting to see that they've left so much of the explosive, jazzy, really experimental side and really hunkered down and focused in on accessible, digestible tracks. And I think this works in its ultimate favor. But on the other hand, there's an ocean to dive into in terms of creativity. The title track of Red being so harsh and so oomph. Uh, now, I mean, if I do have to point out weaknesses, that first track off of the second side Got to be in the certain mindset of, uh, because it is one of those very impressionistic, very emotive, like wandering the wilderness kind of thing where you're kind of finding out where the music is. It's not to the extent of, say, like Moonchild from In the Court of the Crimson King, but it does have that flavor of it. Uh, and I'm wondering if it really worked completely. I think it works better than Moonchild, but it still has that really fun aspect. And I love how it builds straight into Starless. So yeah, this is one of my favorite albums of all time. This is one that I will put on. It's a very evening album. All right, we're coming down to the final two. Once I release what number two is, you'll automatically know what number one is just through process of elimination. So let's talk about number two first. Number two. Islands, released in 1971. I love, 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 love this album. It is so freaking good. It is one of the most unique albums. It is the most like somber, pastoral, intimate albums that King Crimson has ever done. You have to be in the right mood for this album as well. Like if you're not in the right mood, don't even try. But if you're in that right mood, this album is just the perfect treat. There's no low point and the explosiveness of this album is very similar to being like Lost at Sea where at points it is so beautiful and so somber and you've got nothing but air around you. But at other times it's terrifying. You're caught up in a storm. It's explosive. Ugh, the opening track and the opening suite of this just moves through so many different aspects it's it's akin to like a symphony and that's not including like all the different strings that we have on here that's not including all the different instruments that we have it's really saying so much within this album and what i love is just letting it wash over me and again pardon the pun but letting those waves just wash over me and take me to all those different places it it really is like being lost at sea in the most terrifying, but also in the most enjoyable aspect of that. And I can't help but love it. This is a perfect example of what progressive rock should be. There's no album that came before it. There's no album that came after it that is pretty much like this. And like that last track off of this album, so deceivingly heart-wrenching like you don't realize how impactful it is because it's not a very big song like a lot of the other tracks that king crimson has done but it's just as impactful as any of those big explosive tracks are so yeah that's why i really really love this track and why i think so many people really need to go out and listen to islands so that leaves us with number one this is the the final one and i mean it really should be no surprise of what it is like you knew what it was coming into this uh this video so let's just talk about it let's talk about number one number one in the court of the crimson king released in 1969 yep yep i mean it, this is one of those albums and one of those moments where it's like how could this not be number one often imitated but never recaptured even by the band themselves. Like I believe Robert Fripp says that the, the spirit of genius or the spirit of like a masterpiece will come and visit a band. And in this sense, it, it definitely visited the band for this album, but it was never able to recapture. I mean, if most people know a King Crimson album, this is going to be the album that they know. This has Epitaph. This has I Talk to the Wind. This has 21st Century Schizoid Man, this has In the Court of the Crimson King, like these are the ones that people come back to and it is their most popular works. And I think the thing that I love about this album so much is how different it is from everything else. Like even though 21st Century Schizoid Man has that explosive tendencies and that really big jazzy approach, 
it's those smaller moments that people love. Or at least that's the reason why I love it. I love I Talk to the Wind. I love Epitaph. And I love In the Court of the Crimson King, the title track of this album. This one still makes me weep. This one still makes me gush. And this is one of the albums that really, really got me into progressive rock. Like, I got this back in high school. And I just fell so hard for this album. And it has treated me so well throughout my life. And I'll still come back to it and still get more and more and more out of it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's about it. That's it for all the studio albums from King Crimson were ranked from worst to best, in my opinion. What do you guys think? What's your favorite King Crimson album? What is your least favorite album? Which is one that you think gets overlooked too much? In my mind, the ones that got overlooked are Power to Believe, Islands, and Lizard. Um, but I also really love Construction of Light and Thrack. So let me know of your own thoughts about King Crimson and their albums and what your ranking would be by commenting down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. This was a blast to do and I've been holding off doing this for a while for a special time. And I feel like right now is the perfect time for this kind of a video. So there you go, my gift to you. Ah, <sighs> it's finally done. <laughs> oh boy. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, you guys are definitely the best. And until next time, notes out.